Oh, a professor does a derivation in class? I told my undergraduates this term. Because they didn't have time to prepare a lecture. I mean, I never understood why a professor would come in and spend, you know, half an hour or the whole hour deriving some differential equation or some thermodynamic proof or math proof or something until the first year I was a faculty member and I was teaching a course and I'd been really busy and I really didn't have time to prepare the lecture that day. And you come in and you got, you know, an hour and a half before class and you don't, you know, to really prepare a lecture. Uh, for the first time you ever give it, give it takes about 10 hours of preparation for one hour of lecture. I mean, I never knew that until I became a faculty member. I mean, I've been a TA and stuff, but you just do recitations and you kind of, you can spend an hour preparing for a recitation and go into the recitation and ask questions. But actually prepare a lecture and get things together and organize your thoughts and take all of this information, try to condense it down in an organized way, it takes a lot of time. So anyway, what happened is I, you know, I, I didn't really have a lecture, but class was coming up, so I just did a derivation. <laughs> and I realized that was why professors did derivations in class. I mean, they will tell you that it's important. For, in fact, I asked professors after that, well, it's important for the students to learn how to do it. Give me a break. You're MIT students. I mean, you can't take a handwritten derivation and figure out, follow it through. You know, it's usually just algebra. Okay, even if it's differential equations, it's just sort of algebra once you see it, right? Because you're just transposing things. So I've always believed that if you're going to, you, sh you shouldn't really be doing derivations in class. You should uh, um, uh, write out the derivation. That's what I used to do when I taught undergraduates thermo. I used to write out the derivation, hand it out, and then say, okay, if it wasn't in the book, now let's discuss what it means, right? But I mean, how many classes have you sat through where they just spend the whole time doing the derivation, and screwing it up on the board, by the way, right? I mean, nine times out of 10, I mean, very few professors can go through the whole, the whole derivation without making a mistake somewhere. Um, and it's much better to write it out ahead of time, hand it out to the students, and then discuss what it means. I mean, they usually don't even get in derivation, they don't even usually get to the point of what it all means. And you're left sitting there and you're bored to death. I mean, why come to class? That's why I quit going to faculty meetings. I mean, you know, they just sit up there and it's like listening to a derivation. They make announcements. <clears throat> anyway, so that's that soapbox. But it's important to know. Um, actually, I also told my undergraduate class, uh, they always complain about students learning to write. I mean, they do this at every university. But, um, well, actually, you're, you're all probably too far removed from your freshman year, but you, how, many, how, many, how many pages of essay did you have to write per year in college? Depends on what college you went to. Not many. I mean, less than 20? You went to engineering school? Essay? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, I went to engineering school. Yeah, you went to engineering school. It was less than 20, right? Anybody else want to? I didn't do more, but I took a lot of English classes in my first year. So. Okay, so you wrote more. 70? 80? Okay, 50. Well, they always complain. Of, and I know years ago at MIT, the freshman class basically wrote about 20 to 30 pages. And that was because of their humanities classes primarily. My, my oldest child went to Princeton, and he wrote about 150 his freshman year. And you want to know why they can communicate better? Because they practice, you know? Now, why, here's the real clue, why do MIT professors not ask you to write more? They have to read it. They have to read it, exactly. Can you imagine? I mean, it takes time, right? Why am I letting you all do uh, quizzes together, you know, your homeworks together if you do the problem solutions, right? Because if you all turn in one, I only have to grade one, right? And for my philosophy of this course, at this level, I wouldn't even make you do anything if the institute didn't require it, right? You should be here because you love it. And breakfast is all right, too, right? Anyway, OK. Anything else? Uh, if you don't have any questions, then i got to start lecturing. OK, ready? Are we on? We got all that on. That's OK. Leave it on. I mean, I don't mind the truth coming out, right? <laughs> OK. Uh, I actually, I was trying to think of what the the nugget was for yesterday and just determined there was none, okay? Um, 
I basically kind of gave you a bunch of examples of forming of metals and forging and rolling, and it was sort of stories and handouts, you know, or you know, touchy feelies. So, what's the lesson from yesterday? There was no lesson. Okay, no theme to take away. Nothing you have to remember, other than well, you kind of got a little bit of a feel for metalworking. Um, I started looking. We've this. We've only got three. This is our third to the last lecture today. Therefore, I'm not going to have time to go through weldability of metals. But since most of you are not metallurgists anyway, you don't have to worry about that. I did lecture on it in last year in 3371, and it's on the web in lectures 9, 10, 11. I think number 9 is on steels, number 10 is on aluminum and titanium, and number 11 is on other metals. So if you really want to, and you want extra credit, you won't get it. Okay, uh, but you can watch it out of the goodness of your heart. Okay, or you cannot watch it out of the goodness of your heart. It doesn't matter. Um, and it, you know, you don't really have to worry about it. Someday, if I ever get the book written, you can buy a copy of the book and then you can read it. Right. But in the meantime, you got to watch it on the web. Right. If you want to know about it. So what we're going to do today is is uh, go through. Um, Non-destructive testing, which last year I only did one lecture on because I ran out of time. So this year I want to do three lectures. That way, as I do this, I can keep building this up, and someday this will be a 12-unit course. Uh, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> um, so today I want to talk about uh, non-destructive testing. You should recognize, and I've said before, all materials have flaws. I mean, even even a that perfect bowl of silicon. It's still got vacancies. It doesn't have dislocations, but it's got crystal defects of vacancies. I didn't, it does how it's not supposed to. The, the smaller ones didn't. They actually have made dislocation-free silicon. But you're saying they have a few dislocations. But a dislocation, a dislocation in silicon can screw up the properties. It certainly doesn't have 10 to the tenth per per square centimeter. Maybe 10, to the two or 10 to the two. Yeah, I mean. A typical annealed metal has 10 to the 10th dislocations. If you if you did a if you found out how many pieces of spaghetti dislocation and counted them in a typical metal, it would have 10 to the 10th dislocations per you know pieces of spaghetti per square centimeter. The silicon, the big bull of silicon, because of thermal stresses um, during crystal growth, you're saying has 10 to the two. They did make stuff back in the six-inch bull size that was basically they said dislocation free. Now, I don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. They will still have vacancies, which are atomic point defects. Uh, at any temperature above absolute zero, you will have, there is an equilibrium concentration of vacancies. So you're always going to have flaws in the material. And a vacancy or a dislocation is a flaw for silicon. It's not for a metal, for a structural material, but it is for an electron some electronic materials. Not all electronic materials, but some. So there are always flaws. And we talked about casting. And you cast things, and the typical flaw size is going to be proportional to the size of the casting. Whether it's 10% of the casting diameter, or characteristic length of the casting, or 5%, or depends on how you cast, but it's going to be some fraction. Hopefully, it's not half. If it's half, you ought to be able to see it most of the time. But you're going to have flaws that are somewhere between a few percent and 10% of the casting characteristic length um, in the material. And you try to get rid of those, but even when you try to get rid of them, you don't always get rid of them by rolling and forging and hipping and, and stuff. So they're all, you're always going to have flaws, but the question is, are the flaws defects? Because a flaw is not necessarily a defect. Anybody know how you define a defect? A defect is something, is a flaw which makes the product Unfit for service. Now, that's sort of a uh, a begging the question definition, uh, in the sense that now I have to ask the question of what is the service? What are the service stresses I'm going to have on this part? If I'm building a pipeline to carry gas from Louisiana to New Jersey, and that was actually the first big welded pipeline in the world in the 1930s, it was a it was a 30-inch diameter pipeline bringing gas from um, the Gulf states up to New Jersey. Um, and it was one of the first critical all-welded cons uh, steel construction pipelines. And remember, I mentioned early on that a, 
a pipeline has more basic materials costs than anything else. About a third of the cost of the pipeline is actually the cost of the steel pipe. Digging you know, a hole in the ground and sticking this pipe in is a lot simpler than, in a sense, than building an automobile, which is much more complex for an airplane or something. So uh, it turns out because something like a pipeline has a fairly simple geometry, it's very easy, or relatively easy, actually it's not quite that easy, there's a whole books on it, varied pipelines, on calculating the stresses that are on it. Um, it turns out you can operate a pipeline, and typically they operate a pipeline at 75% of its specified minimum yield strength of the material. Now remember for fatigue, we only operated um, most things at less than 50%. If you're below 50%, you don't get fatigue. Well, in a pipeline, you're above 50%, so you'll get fatigue if there's any type of notch. And in fact, there was a big explosion in New Jersey uh, a number of years ago of a 40, I think it's a 42 inch diameter pipeline in Edison, New Jersey, and it had fatigued over time and finally just ripped open under the high pr pressure of the gas at about, the gas was about 900 PSI in this pipeline. And you can, if you go through and figure out the stress, it's about 72% of the strength of the steel, of the ultimate strength of the steel. And so the cr fatigue crack will propagate because there's variations in pressure in the pipeline every day. You know, people use more gas for a while and the pressure goes down a little bit. So there's, there's fluctuating stresses. Um, so this thing had let go. And when they went in to try, try to find out why it let go, they found that there were all kinds of backhoe marks on this pipeline. The place where it failed was actually an asphalt plant where they always had these backhoes digging up the asphalt and stuff. And it turns out they have airplanes that fly over the pipeline uh, once a week to see if anybody's doing any construction. Okay, a guy getting a little, you know, um, two-seater airplane or whatever that goes fairly slow, um, typically one or two people, um, many times it's the pilot plus a spotter, and sometimes it's just the pilot, but in any case, um, they fly once a week to make sure that some contractor is not digging where the pipeline is to do damage to the pipeline. I can't remember, I've seen the statistics, but it's a huge fraction of the pipeline failures are due to damage due to construction in the area. And in fact, most states now have something called dig safe. If you're digging up anywhere in the ground, you're supposed to call up this dig safe number and the various utilities, the gas company, the electric company, the water company are all supposed to, before you dig, come out and mark out where their utilities are buried in the ground so you don't dig them up. You know, it's, it can be, you can create a flood if you hit a water pipe, uh, you can destroy electrical service. Um, I just had to deal with a problem where a steel pipe that had a 250 kilovolt electrical transmission line buried in the ground um, basically ruptured one night in the water because it was near a water pipe and it flooded and everything and it costing the, the ultimate cost of this failure was millions of dollars. No, nobody got hurt. It's just a little bit of water trickling out of the ground, although eventually you got all kinds of insulating oil from the electrical pipeline into the, into the uh, New Jersey watershed um, and into the uh, some R Raritan River. But, but so there's all kinds of environment, not all kinds, but there was some environmental damage. Um, but it wasn't serious. No one really got hurt uh, physically. But then when you have something like the, uh, um, the, the New Jersey gas explosion, gas pipeline explosion, there were flames 600 feet in the air in the middle of the night. Um, the roofs of the apartment buildings next door melted from the heat of this flame. Nobody got hurt. They claimed that one woman uh, five miles away had a heart attack and died. And she was 80 some years old, but you know, certain probability she might have had a heart attack that night anyway, even if there hadn't been a lot of noise. Um, in any case, it can be a big problem when something happens. Well, they found gouge marks, like a hundred gouge marks, around this pipe. And people wondered, well, how could that ever happen? Well, it turns out they had a, um, a settling pond on the site, and apparently they would dig underneath the settling pond, so when the plane flew over every week, they couldn't see that any construction was going on. They had construction equipment right there above the pipeline anyway. They didn't see any digging on the ground, but there was digging underneath the settling pond. <laughs> Okay, and so they were, guys, get down. Okay, now they claimed that the pipeline had never been, um, there had never been any digging in the in the area around there um, for uh, 
something like 15 years. This occurred in the mid 90s. But when they, when the pipeline blew up and and the ground all got moved away, and they started excavating to remove the pipe to repair it, they found a fully buried 1988 Ford Bronco, okay, car, right, truck, SUV, back in 19. Supposedly they had never, no one had ever dug in this area since 1980, before 1985. But somehow someone had buried a 1988 Ford Bronco. So we sort of doubted whether there had never been any full excavation in that area, given the fact we found a full, full-size vehicle buried in the ground. You always have to ask yourself if the mafia was involved. Um, but in any case, the damage was caused by a big gouge in the pipe. That's a, that's a defect. That's, uh, and you can calculate from fracture mechanics what size flaw would constitute a defect at a given stress level. Remember, it's, got, it's just k is the square root of pi c, right? The square root of sigma is pi c. If you know the operating stress and you know the toughness of the material, you can calculate the flaw size. So you know these two, and all you, if you know those two, you can calculate the critical flaw size that causes the thing to rupture. And you can calculate the fatigue crack growth rate and whatnot. Now, non-destructive testing, essentially, which is what I want to talk about right now, is a way to um, try to measure and make sure that I don't have any flaws of critical size in my material. Now, to make any measurement on a material, we can kind of go back to things that border on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Anybody remember that from the quantum mechanics? What's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? If I want to know where an electron is, how do I? You can't. You can know actually the product of location and uh, velocity. Or actually, you can you can know velocity or location, but you can't know both at the same time. Or you can only know them within certain ranges. Okay, there's a limit as to how precisely you can know it. Uh, or you can know momentum and time. Okay, but you can't know, you know um, both of them independently and with great precision, with perfect precision. There's a limit, and that's because if I actually make a measurement, the only way I can make a measurement is somehow have energy interact with that electron. I mean, I, I mean there are electrons all around me, but I, don't, I can't see them unless I do something to measure them, which means I have to have energy interact with matter. Whether that's a photon, when they, when they do these things on Bose-Einstein condensates, they get things down to ultra-low temperatures like 10 to the minus 6 degrees above absolute zero and everything gets into a quantum state, they have a little bit of a problem because if they go shining light on there, they're going to warm it up. Okay? It just it disturbs the whole thing. Well, we don't have to worry about warming things up, but we do if we want to measure anything in the material, we have to have it interact with energy. And the question is, what types of energy? Well, there's lots of types of energy. And basically, just like in welding, Virtually any energy source anyone ever develops that's high enough power to melt something, they end up using it for welding. I don't know if I actually got to that in the first lecture, but if you went to the web last year, I certainly talked about it. To, but to measure a flaw or a defect, if it's unfit for service, uh, which is a function of the stress uh, that it's being used at, we must have energy interact with matter. Well, there's electromagnetic energy, which is photons. There's mechanical energy, which are called phonons. Some of you haven't really heard that, but basically phonons are just sound vibrations in the, in the solid or the liquid, okay? That's the physicist's fancy name for sound waves going through a material. There's thermal energy. Sometimes people heat something up and see how heat flows through it. Do that with composite materials all the time. You've seen these pictures of a, someone's hand and it shows the heat pattern of their hand. That's infrared imaging and you're measuring the temperature of the hand. Um, at different locations. You can also hit it with particles or have liquids, other matter, interact with the material. And so particles could be neutrons. We do various types of neutron diffraction or neutron activation. Electrons, positrons, virtually anything you can think of. In terms of uh, non-destructive testing, we actually use liquids, which are, we'll talk about dipenetrant or magnetic particle testing, uh, which is sometimes got a liquid, uh, a slurry of solid particles in a liquid. 
So you can coat it with liquids and see if the liquids penetrate cracks and, and things like that. So you can use lots of different types of energy. If we now want to look and see, if you want to think about, well, I'm going to start a new business on non-destructive testing, I just have to find where no one else has ever looked before, right? This is the old uh, Easter egg hunt. So the electromagnetic spectrum, and I don't have the frequency on here, but you go from radio waves, and there are times when people actually have used uh, radio waves to inspect things. Microwaves certainly are, have been used, and nuclear magnetic resonance, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is in the same type of frequency range as microwaves. Infrared, that's the using the photons that uh, from someone's hand, and the not visible photons, but you know, infrared photons, that's thermal energy imaging. In the visible range, uh, we have lasers that both span infrared and, and visible. We have mo moiré inter uh, interferometry where you basically put a, a grid of light over another grid of light and look at the, how they inter interact. I don't know if you've ever seen a moir moiré pattern, I ought to get a copy of one sometime and, and show it to you. But you can see changes in the surface. If you shine structured light on a surface, one pattern, and then put another pattern on top of it, you can see big changes. You magnify things dramatically. Holography, which is a laser technique, is used in that range. Ultraviolet light is sometimes used on some materials, not on metals, because it doesn't penetrate them. X-rays will penetrate metals. You get a high enough energy now that you can penetrate the metal. Uh, and gamma rays, well, we don't exactly use gamma rays for non-destructive testing, but that's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you look on here, you're going to find that there are a lot of other bright people who have been looking for the Easter eggs here. And probably the only area they haven't looked is electromagnetic radiation at very low wavelengths or very high wavelengths. So if you've got some great gamma ray telescope that you want to use to, uh, and some great idea, maybe you can sell it to somebody, but don't come bother me about it. Um, but virtually anything you can think of, someone has already filled in that part of the spectrum. Okay? I'm sure you can find a venture capitalist who will buy it. Actually, I'm not sure you can, but you can find some investors on in Wall Street. Maybe not a venture capitalist, but anyway. Uh, the venture capital will buy it. Capitalist will buy it if he thinks he can find the investors, right? Sucker born every minute, as P.T. Barnum said. Okay, the me mechanical energy spectrum um, spans from very low frequencies to 10 to the 13th hertz. And 10 to the 13th hertz is the limit of the speed of sound in condensed phases. We went through this before. If you take the velocity of sound, which is up to 5,000 meters per second in a solid, um, divided by the, the uh, wavelength between two atoms, which is on the order of an angstrom, that gives you a frequency of 5 times 10 to the 13th hertz. Sometimes people say it's 2 times 10 to the 13th hertz because it's 2 and a half angstroms between atoms. Take whatever number you want. I don't care. On the order of magnitude, it's 10 to the 13th hertz. Or you can say it's 10 to the 14th hertz because 5 times 10 to the 13th is closer to 10 to the 13th on a logarithmic scale than, uh, than it is to 10 to the 13th. But people usually say on the order of 10 to the 13th hertz. Now, down here, about the highest frequency that is actually used is the ultrasonic microscope. The ultrasonic microscope, you actually take a solid material you put it in a liquid bath and you have these piezoelectric transducers that you can go to 100 million hertz. Okay, this is, um, I mean, we're kind of familiar with some of these, these types of terms now from computers and stuff. But this is very, very high frequency. You start figuring out the wavelength at 10 to the 8th, and it's a fraction, it's like a hundredth of a millimeter. Okay, typically, if we do ultrasonic testing, if you were um, looking at the frequencies, they use ultrasound to look at a pregnant woman's womb and see if you know see how the baby's doing or or whatever. Those frequencies are down in the megahertz regime, 100 times less, and the characteristic wavelengths are on the order of millimeters. So the the smallest pixel, you will, might be on the order of a millimeter, unless you want to go to 10. You can go obviously go to 10 to the 7th in between and you get down a fraction of a millimeter. But for you know, identifying things uh, for materials, we're generally happy with something in the megahertz regime. Uh, typical, most common frequency is two and a quarter megahertz. And that typically gives you a wavelength on the order of two or three millimeters. 
uh, and the, you can't measure anything smaller than the wavelength size, right? Yep. You mean up here? You mean up here? Oh yeah, this is not a in the electromagnetic spectrum, the answer is yes. In the mechanical spectrum, you don't get far enough. I mean the, the propagation of sound dies off too quickly, okay? But for the electromagnetic spectrum, yes. If if I have certain types of non destructive test equipment, I have to meet FCC, Federal Communications Commission standards. For example, but even more important, like arc welding power supplies have to meet FCC regulations because they're going to generate all kinds of electromagnetic noise in all kinds of spectrum ranges because I've got a welding arc vibrating at in this regime where you have radio waves and communications. If you've ever been around someone striking an arc and they have the radio on, you just hear static on the radio because I now have a radio generator that's generating white noise uh, that's more powerful because it's closer. Okay, I got hundreds of amps vibrating, um, and so there, you do have to meet FCC regulations in the electromagnetic spec spectrum, depending on the power level. I mean, the FCC is not just frequency, but it's the power that you're radiating, right? Why, why does a Wi-Fi only work? Some of them work, well, your wire, wireless mouse works three to ten feet away from the computer. Your Wi-Fi works within, what, a hundred yards, maybe. It has to do with the power that you're radiating. I mean, you know, go, to, go get a... Um, a, uh, a walkie-talkie now that you can get for 50 bucks. You can buy two of them at Costco or Sam's for 50 bucks. And they're like a one watt or a half watt. Some of them are three watt, okay? Well, you know, a r local radio station is going out at 5,000 watts, okay? So they go a lot further than a mile away with a one watt uh, uh, signal sender. In the mechanical spectrum, it turns out there are mechanical waves that are very powerful. I mean, an earthquake, right? Um, but we tend not to be able to generate mechanical energy that goes very far. Uh, now, you can, it'll go plenty far in a solid material at 5,000 hertz. Um, so we can we can vibrate things. Um, we have well, we talked about ultrasonic acoustic emission. As as a part is, if a part is cracking. It will, as the crack moves, it will send out stress waves. And those stress waves are sound waves, phonons. They may be at 100 kilohertz. You can't hear them. Now, sometimes you can hear a crack let go. You ever heard, uh, anybody ever heard a tensile specimen break? It goes bang, right? Uh, or when something breaks, you can snap something, and you hear, the, you hear the sound of the fracture. Well, that sound can be picked up. Some of it's not audible to, to a human ear because it's in a different frequency range. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it can be measured. And I told you the story about uh, the Air Force general who wasn't going to let an Air Force jet fly with a crack in it, so we had to fly the test in an Australian jet, right? Because the Australian, I guess the Australian general, generals weren't smart enough to know that some of their aircraft had cracks in them or that they would be harmful. Whereas the American general, U.S. general, was smart enough to know he didn't like cracks, okay? Don't tell him he had cracks, but don't, you know. Um, in any case, mechanical vibration. One of the simplest test techniques is just to thunk something. Okay? Uh, you ever tested something to see if it's hollow or solid by thunking it? That's a non destructive test. You just hit it with a hammer. And it actually works very well. I mean, I've heard some people say, well, it's a pretty crude test. Well, I don't care if it's crude, if it works, you know? Um, so there's all kinds of mechanical vibration. Uh, surface roughness. You take a little stylus, like a phonograph needle, and you run it over the surface of something, and we call it, that's actually called by the manufacturer's name now, tally surf, and you actually measure the surface roughness, and you can put it on a chart recorder and listen to the noise. You know, you can see the noise, you can graph the noise. People will sometimes measure bearings and how they're running by just basically putting a microphone up against the object, and that's sort of acoustic emission. Um, that has a special name too among in the bearing industry. Uh, I can't remember the name right now, but it has they give it a special name in the bearing industry. But they're just listening for the sounds of the bearings running rough because they have a moving part. One of the problems with acoustic emission when you actually go out to measure something is trying to figure out what it is you're actually measuring because noise can come from all kinds of things. For example, if uh, people try to do acoustic emission on, emission on welds on arc welds, the problem is is the arc weld heats up, the material expands and it's being it's you know 
if this is the plate being welded, it's being supported on something else, and as it expands, there's slight thermal movement, which generates noise. So you always get signals. They may not mean anything in terms of a defect, but you always get signals. So acoustic emission has always been a lot harder than people had really hoped for. So far as surface roughness now, it turns out that the fancier surface roughness monitors are now laser-based. So you shine light on things and you actually see the variation in the surface roughness uh, as we've improved lasers. But in the old days, it was basically just a fancy phonograph needle. Uh, and at still a lower frequency, it takes a, a couple of seconds to measure the hardness of something. That's just indenting a little um, probe under a known weight into the surface and finding out how deep it goes. The softer something is, the deeper it goes under a known, known load. Um, so that's called hardness testing. Um, and then there's proof testing. And proof testing is used quite often on parts um, to pressurize them if it's a container. For example, uh, propane tanks for your home cooking grill and stuff, every single one of those got pressure tested at, let's see, at about 200 and, let's see, the maximum pressure up to 130, 120 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit for propane, you can find out thermodynamically, is like 120 PSI. So the design test pressure, or the design pressure is twice that for a safety factor of 240 PSI. So it's, it's like 120 PSI actual maximum thermodynamic pressure that propane can generate. So they put a factor of two on that for the design, so you have to, the FC, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, or is it, I think it's, can't remember which federal commission, no, DOT, Department of Transportation, basically says you can't transport pro propane in cylinders um, unless you have a, a 240 PSI rating um, of, of your cylinder, and then the actual design verification requires another factor of two above that, 480. So you actually got a factor of four above operating at 120 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's only in Las Vegas it gets above 130 degrees Fahrenheit. My son was out in Las Vegas uh, my, when he was about 20 and he, uh, he actually did fry an egg on the sidewalk just to prove it could be done when it was 130 degrees up. Uh, typical thing James would do. Because, um, you know, I said it was hot enough to fry an egg on the sidewalk. Yep, up there it is. Um, so anyway, you, you have these proof testing where you load everything up. Now, there's, there's people are confused about safety factors uh, when they design things. There is a design safety factor, which, for example, for a propane cylinder, is 240 psi, even though you're only going to operate at 120 psi. You're going to design it so it'll take 240, but you're going to do a design verification test at 480, and that means you're going to build a prototype and you're going to pressurize it. For example, uh, take a, a home heating oil tank. holds 250 gallons of oil if you've got oil in your house for your heat. It's, it should never see more than 5 psi pressure when, they, uh, when the guy's pumping the oil in if he does it properly. I'll tell you this story about when it's not done properly. But um, So it's designed for a stress of 5 PSI. It should probably never see more than 1 or 2 PSI, but it's designed with enough safety factor to give you 5 PSI. However, to prove the design of the overall tank, they build one tank, and the code, the state code, requires you pressurize the tank to 25 PSI before it leaks. I mean, that's a factor of five safety above your design. So you have a design uh, stress. You have a design verification test. Now, it turns out if you take one of those and you pressurize it, you usually pressurize it with water, not air. Uh, but you pressurize it, if you pressurize it with 25 PSI air and it let go, all of a sudden you, may, you might kill somebody. Um, so you pressurize it with water. At about 15 PSI, it will start to bulge, OK? I mean, if you pressurize it with water, one of these home heating oil tanks, typically at about 15 to 20 PSI, you'll start to see the sides start to pop out and blow up like a balloon. It's, it's going from its oval, kind of oval cross-section, rectangular cross-section, and um, 
uh, trying to turn into a sphere, right? Because that spherical shape will, can maintain the greatest pressure, right? So it's trying to turn itself into a sphere, and that's putting stress on the welds. You have to get to 25 psi bloated before you uh, uh, before you leak. If you can't do that on the one you make as a test prototype, then you fail, and you have to change your design of your your welds and everything else. So I've got this home heating oil tank like this, right? And it's got fittings and everything else. You don't want those to fail. Typically, it will fail at the weld because it's the most highly stressed location. It's going from this oval rectangular type of shape to trying to be a sphere. The ends bulge out. And now I start bending these welds to the most highly stressed locations. I have to get in my to 25 PSI without a leak. Now, so I design it for 5 PSI. I test it for leaking. Um, at 25 psi, I can't test every one of them at 25 psi because they would bulge. Okay, and nobody wants to buy a bulge tank anytime you get up above about 15 psi. So it turns out every one of those is tested at 5 psi. So there's a design pressure, there's a verification pressure. There's a proof test pressure. This one for this one happens to be 5 psi, 25 psi, and 5 psi. This is what you calculate. It's just a sheet of paper. Um, this one is actually you take one and you verify that you you actually build your design and make sure it works. And then there's the proof test. Every single one you produce has to see that pressure. So just like we go back to the propane tanks. The propane tanks um, is designed for 240. It's tested at 480. And it's proof tested. I think it's 240. It might be 120. I don't remember the proof test, but I, I think it's 240. Uh, and that gives you different safety factors. Over the actual operating, for this one, the operating should never be more than 1 or 2 PSI. As it sits there with oil in it, it's actually about a half a PSI, just the weight of the oil in it. This one, the maximum you should ever see is 120 PSI. So you have these different things, and people always get confused. They say, well, the safety factor is X. Which safety factor? The design safety factor, the design verification safety factor, or the proof test factor? In any case, proof testing is basically just loading it up and seeing if it fails. Uh, if you make every one and you proof test it beyond destroying it, bulging it, then you can be assured that if you test it at a higher pressure than it's going to operate, that it won't fail. At least not initially. Not unless you get a fatigue crack that grows over time or corrosion that proceeds and makes bigger flaws over time. OK. Um, any questions on that? People always get engineer. Many engineers get confused about that. Yes. So proof, is proof testing one that you do on a more regular basis? You do it on for critical things like a propane tank or an oil tank where you have an environmental concern of an oil spill. You test every single one. It's required to test every. You cannot sell it unless you test it. Okay, and that's that's done 100%. This one you're doing one prototype. This one is your original clean sheet of paper design. Does that make sense? So that's, again, it's confusing to people because there's different tests. But in any case, I mean, the, there's no difference between this test and this test other than the test pressure. And you're going to destroy the part most of the time here. You often destroy the part. You can't destroy the part because you want to sell 100% of your product. But if you, you know, if you want to make sure you pick out that one out of a thousand that has a defect in it, a large enough flaw that it would fail early on in its life, then you do 100% proof, proof load testing. Things like pipelines. You can't put a pipeline in service. The Department of Transportation will not allow you to put it in service unless you load it up. The, the state plumbing code won't allow you to put a gas line in service unless you pressurize it and test it. And so I mean, even the, the line going to your house, they they 
it has a pressure of about a quarter psi of gas, of the line, feeding gas to your house. But once they hook it up, they're supposed to go around with some soap, you know, and they might pressurize it with air first rather than gas. Better than blowing up your house the first time. Okay, it's not too bad if air leaks into your house. But you know, and they they go around with Snoop, okay, which is basically a, a high-priced soap sol solution that uh, forms bubbles if you got a leak. So there's different ways to test. Now, what's the size of the critical flaws that we have to be worried about in the real world? Uh, and now maybe since I hadn't done really done this for you before, let you go back to this fundamental equation of fracture mechanics. The typical type of toughnesses of metals are in the 20 to 200 range, and somewhere here. 20 to 200 KSI square root of inch, wonderful units. Um, this is KSI, oops, this is megapascal square root of meter, but it's almost, it's, the difference between that and KSI square root of inch is only one point, a factor of 1.1, so it doesn't really matter. On a log scale, you can't tell the difference. And you see that for metals up here, you get above 100, so you're getting up here. The toughest steels and nickel alloys are up here around 200. Uh, but the typical steels is down around 50 to 100. Um, you can see down here the bottom of the steels. Little, I'll talk about that in a second. Some of the cast irons actually go below 10, but, but most cast irons are, are, are mo the, uh, the most brittle materials we have, the gray cast irons. We have ductile iron, which is actually way up here. Uh, well, uh, well up here uh, in this range. But those are the metals. The ceramics are way down here on the order of a tenth to two. So um, just looking at that, let's take a, so if we have a, a range of, let's say, 20 to 200 typically, George Irwin, the father of fracture mechanics, once, uh, someone told me, he once said that the lowest a steel could ever go is 20. KSI square root of inch. The most brittle steel you could possibly make is only about 20. So if you put in a typical value for just a steel they built this bu uh, building out of or something, 50 KSI square root of inch, and you put in a typical stress, actually this is a pretty high stress. Typical stress levels are more like 15 or 20 KSI for structural steels, but let's just put in 25. And square root of pi C, that says that C is equal to 4 over pi, or 1.3 inches. That's a pretty good size flaw. You're not going to get a brittle fracture and just have a piece of steel rip open um, in a building like this unless you have huge defects. If we go to a ceramic now, where the typical values are a tenth to 10, and we put in a higher range value, 2 KSI square root of inch. There's only a few ceramics to get all the way up to 10. And put in a similar type of stress, we find that the critical flaw size is about the size of a human hair. Okay, three thousandths of an inch. That's why there is no such thing as a high-performance structural ceramic. Okay, and hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars were spent by ceramists trying to make such materials. When anybody who knew anything about fracture could have told them, yes. Sure. Okay. Um, anyway, I'll just leave it up. Um, so this actually tells me something about the size flaw that I have to detect. And this is one of the reasons why ceramics are so expensive. Because you can spend five times as much inspecting them as it takes to make them. Because you've got to make sure that they don't have flaws that are any bigger than a human hair. Or sometimes even smaller than that. And that gets to be very difficult. Now, it turns out typical flaw sizes in most metals are on the order uh, for uh, criteria are on the order of an eighth of an inch. Anything less than an eighth of an inch, they don't worry about it. You're only trying to inspect for an eighth, eighth of an inch flaw. Now, that sometimes will get you in trouble. Um, for example, the Seawolf submarine back in the early 1990s was the 21st century submarine. This is before all the, uh, it had been designed in the 80s before peace broke out with the former Soviet Union. But this was the big two billion dollar attack sub for the United States and they were going to build a whole fleet of them. They ended up building two or three. But the first Seawolf in the early 90s was being built and a grinder was grinding the weld smooth on the outside hull. It was down an electric boat. That's because you can't even have the weld reinforcement as it goes through the water. 
there'll be enough turbulence as the water as it goes through the water, just from the reinforcement of the weld, an eighth of an inch above the surface, even though it's nice and smooth. That'll create enough noise that they can hear it on the sonar, okay, and detect the sub. Okay, so they have to grind it smooth. So he's grinding these welds. The welds have been made, and he was grinding the surface smooth. And he noticed that the grinding swarf, the little powders that were being ground away, were actually lining up. <clears throat> they were, as he looked at the surface, he would see little, the steel was being magnetized slightly, and he would see little indications, like a sixteenth of an inch long, where the grinding swarf was sitting there. He was actually doing a poor man's magnetic particle inspection. The iron particles, the grinding swarf of the steel was magnetized just in the Earth's magnetic field. And there was a crack there, and the crack creates a magnetic anomaly. And that's what we use, we call magnetic particle testing. Okay? Um, and he was smart enough to say, I've never seen this before, and to tell somebody. And the submarine hull was 18% complete. They went and looked at it. It's a different type of cracking they had never seen before. Ordinarily, you get a crack, and it's a couple of inches long in, during fabrication. And you can find it by all your test techniques, which are looking for eighth of an inch or bigger flaws. But they weren't looking for flaws of size by any of the test techniques. And they had built 18% of the ship, and they had weld metal full of little cracks, little baby cracks. And they had to rip every weld out of the ship, and delayed the whole project about a year, and cost the Navy about a half a billion dollars, okay? Because they got into a regime of different type of cracking that no one had ever seen before. Because they were welding a higher strength steel than they ever had before, okay? Um, in any case, um, typically you're only looking for eighth inch flaws. I have seen a spec, a Boeing spec for titanium where they do an x-ray analysis and they want to see 10 thousandths of an inch flaws. Now, this was, this was kind of a general Boeing spec, um, and it's possible on x-rays to see a ten thousandth of an inch flaw. It's kind of like looking for the period on the end of a piece of paper if the period is in a grayscale that's only slightly different than the surrounding grayscale. So it's not that easy to find, but it can be seen. Um, now, in this particular application, it's probably not worth our time to go through it. They had no need for that. This was basically just duct work in the, inside the air, aircraft to bring in the outside air. And to, did you know there's a lot of ozone up there in the atmosphere? And they actually have to put the incoming air into the cabin through a catalytic converter in order to oxidize the, the or not oxidize, but to reduce the ozone to O2. Otherwise, you get a headache from flying because breathing a bunch of ozone up there. So actually, the air you breathe in an aircraft goes through a catalytic converter. And they were having problems welding the titanium. This was back in the late 80s. They were just about to roll out the 747-400 series, which was their long distance. And they were doing anything to save weight. They had made these things out of stainless steel before. And they switched over to titanium to save a few pounds, even though the cost was skyrocketing. Um, but that's what they needed to be able to fly uh, halfway around the world. Um, in the 747-400. And they had a spec that the welds had to meet. It could not have a flaw larger than 10 thousandths of an inch, and you had one chance to repair the weld. Um, anyway, the story gets better and better, but I don't have time to tell the whole thing. It's a ridiculous spec to put that kind of spec on something. So you leaked a little air out into the atmosphere, OK? <laughs> You're just carrying ductwork, you know, air for people to breathe. If you had, if you had a little pinhole leak, would it make a difference? No. But they were spending a fortune for a requirement that wasn't necessary. Now, there, the other, only other time I've seen x-ray or visual inspection down on a metal down at 10 thousandths range is for repair of turbine blades. Okay, Pratt & Whitney has specs that you cannot have a flaw larger than 10 thousandths of an inch or 15 thousandths in some of their specs. Uh, and that's about the limit of detectability. Unless you start, in fact, even there, you really should be going with a 5X magnifier to look for things. Uh, I have seen flaws where they're looking for fatigue cracks in aircraft skin, uh, and they're telling you to look at it at 5X or 10X. And in fact, if you actually, you're still looking for something about an eighth of an inch in size because that's something that people can usually see. So if you magnify it by a factor of 10, that's a 12 and a half thousandths crack. Okay? 
so that's about the smallest flaw in metals, or the smallest I've seen ever seen is the ten thousandths of an inch in metals. Uh, in getting smaller for ceramics, where the critical flaw is uh, human hair, that means that you want to find something about one third of that in order to have any type of assurance that things not going to fail in service. Have a little safety factor there. Now, inspection requirements. The last thing we'll cover today. Big problem. I, I haven't really, I covered this once last year, and I, I've added this because over the years, I used to see this about once every couple of years. Now I'm seeing it a couple of times a year, where someone will specify the cheap way of inspecting something. For the structural welding code, basically, you have to do a visual inspection of your weld. I mean, you can't follow the code unless you do a visual inspection. Now, there's a whole chapter. And if you want to pay for a more rigorous inspection, like x-rays or ultrasonics, you can. But if you do that, that's an extra cost to the fabricator, and he's going to charge you for it, right? Or if you need proof testing or whatever, if you have tests other than visual, it tells you how to do it. It tells you what the inspection criteria, the accept reject criteria, how big a flaw you can have, how many you can have in a given area, and whatnot. But the mo some of the most critical welds, like on a pressure vessel, a boiler that could blow up, or a pipeline that's stressed very high, may have 100% visual. You always do 100% visual. It's easy, right? Uh, in fact, the welder ought to be able to do it himself. But you also have inspectors come by and check them. But it's easy to, easy to do. It's not terribly expensive. Uh, you need to be trained to know what to look for, but, but you ought to be able to have people do it. And they may have 100% x-ray or ultrasonic testing to look for flaws. That's because the critical weld, if that weld fails on the pressure vessel or on the pipe, you got a rupture. There's no redundancy to the structure. So you do 100% inspection. <clears throat> if you have redundancy in your structure, such as a piece of machinery or a bridge or a building, you may do 100% visual plus 10% of your welds you may x-ray or do ultrasonics on to make sure you don't have a lot of big defects. It's sort of a quality control tool to make sure that the process is in control. Here, you're making sure every weld is good. Here, you're basically just saying, I'm going to do 10% more rigorous inspection, more expensive inspection, uh, to make sure that the process is under control and the probability of producing good welds is high because I'm checking them on a regular basis. And typically, the 10% is selected at random. Right? If you don't select it at random, they'll always figure out a way to, to pass. Right? But you're, you're saving 90% of that inspection cost by only te testing 10%. Now, you're talking about the joists of a building that hold the roof up. Well, you've got multiple joists, very redundant, very low cost product, and it's basically just 100% visual. A lot of the welds in buildings or bridges are just 100% visual. It's only the critical ones, and a designer knows which are the critical hot spots. That if that one fails, you know, part of the structure will come down. But not usually the whole structure. If it's a whole structure will come down, they'll do 100%. Okay. So there's different levels of inspection. Now, the selection of the inspection level depends on the stress level. A pipeline, higher stresses, higher inspection levels, and the safety factor required, which the safety factor depends on the consequence of failure. The safety factor for a joist in a building, 1.67. Five thirds is the safety factor. Okay? Now that's safety factor, you know, for the 50 year snowstorm or whatever. There are codes, the Building Owners and Constructors Association or BOCA code. Uh, and there's state building codes and local building codes that tell you how much snow load you have to design for on a roof. But basically, if you got 67% above that, then you can usually survive the 100 year storm. Now, since these are cutthroat business and people will do anything to shave a few pounds of steel off a joist, um, uh, they're always cutting things and calculating the design because these things are typically design safety factor. Then they build one and verify that it'll take the 1.67. And then there is no proof test until you put it up in the building and see if it falls down. And we have a big snowstorm. I'll have business for, you know, for that year because a few buildings will come down. Now, the key thing here, if the contract calls for this, if you're only buying visual, you can't then later go in and say, oh, I want to do some x-rays on it. Oh, I found a flaw that I couldn't see visually, but I found it by x-ray, and you didn't give me 100% quality? 
And I said I wanted 100% quality. Well, you didn't pay for 100% quality. It's sort of like going and buying a, a Geo and saying later, you know, it doesn't have all the features of the Cadillac. Well, you're absolutely right. You didn't pay for a Cadillac. And in fact, it's very specific in the structural welding code under inspection, section 6.6.5, .6 non-specified, non-destructive testing other than visual. Okay, visual is always required, but if you don't specify it, if it's non-specified, if non-destructive testing other than visual is not specified in the original contract agreement, but is subsequently requested by the owner, okay, the person buying it, the contractor, the person making it, shall perform any requested testing or shall permit any testing to be performed. Either they can do it themselves or if the contractor, if the owner wants to have some outside people, any testing to be performed in accordance with section such and such. The owner shall be responsible for all associated costs, including handling, surface preparation, non-destructive testing, and repair of discontinuities other than those listed in 6.9, whichever is applicable. So the owner is responsible. If they want to buy a Cadillac later, they got to pay for it. This sort of makes sense, right? Okay. Um, at rates mutually agreeable between owner and contractor. However, if such testing should disclose an attempt to defraud or gross nonconformance to this code, repair work shall be done at the contractor's expense. So they always have, the code has a little out there. But fraud's a very difficult thing. Anybody know the difference between fraud and negligence? It's intent. Negligence is just careless, but you didn't mean to do a sloppy job. Fraud means I intended to do a sloppy job. That's a pretty hard thing to prove, that someone intentionally was producing something that was a defective product. As I always say, there's very few people go home at the end of the day and say, I'm really glad I did a lousy job today. Now, some people did go home and they had done a lousy job, but they're blaming their boss or whoever who didn't allow them to do a good job. But very few people intend to do something wrong. Okay, uh, so fraud is almost a criminal type of act, whereas negligence just means, well, you didn't have things under control or your paperwork or this person wasn't trained well enough or something, that's just negligence, okay? So basically, the thing is I see this more and more, there's, as we get more and more attorneys in the world and someone has a problem, and they go talk to their attorney and say, oh, well, Sue, they didn't give you the quality you wanted. Yeah, they gave you the quality. It passed visual inspection. I even have reports from the other side where the experts say it passed visual inspection, but it didn't pass. We cut it open and looked at it in the microscope at 1000X, and we found a flaw. So, okay, all materials have flaws. And you can't now go and use a higher level of inspection and expect that it should pass the highest level of inspection when you didn't pay for it to begin with. But. Fortunately, there are attorneys out there, and I have a job. Thank you.